You are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. For thousands of years, man has gazed upon the great expanses of water, separating humans from a world of the unknown. Mysteries, wonders, and treasures beyond imagination that lay in wait for those brave enough to venture into places that had only been seen in visions and imaginations, and spoken of in legends of explorers from an even more ancient past. Places where great beasts never before seen roamed the waters and routes to places not yet drawn on any map could be discovered. A passage to new worlds. But early exploration by ship was a treacherous task. Even with technological advancements over centuries of travel, war, and conquest. A voyage to never before seen places could bring wealth and glory, but also disease, violence, and death many ships of various nations vanishing, never to be seen again. But the dangers of sea travel were merely a small caveat, a risk surely worth taking for many explorers. And by the 1800s, the nation best poised for even further command of the seas was the mighty British Empire, the Royal Navy seen as the best suited for survival and discovery. Indeed, at this time, there were many places on Earth eluding European eyes, and ships were dispatched all over the world seeking gains for the crown. However, one such place had captured the minds of kingdoms and empires for centuries, a route that, if discovered, would bring wealth and power the likes of which the world had never seen. The infamous Northwest Passage, a place men had failed to locate for hundreds of years, some turning back unsuccessful, others simply disappeared. However, by the 1800s, despite many failures in their search, confidence amongst the British Empire's ability upon the seas had grown. The Arctic and discovery of the passage seemed inevitable. In part, adventurers were propelled by imaginings of such worlds and the wonders they held awaiting the intrepid explorer to find. Beautiful, towering castles of ice, populated by strange and wonderful creatures. Paintings and poetry depicted this polar world as much more magical than formidable. The realities of bitter cold lost amongst the brush strokes of influential renderings creating a mythology around the idea of both a place of great wonder not to be feared, and also the idea of temperate waters beyond the ice, a warm sea awaiting those who would survive the journey. But after multiple expeditions, death, and knowledge shared by those who survived journeys both on land and ship in the Arctic, the notion of a warm polar sea was not convincing solace especially for a man who had lived amongst its bone-chilling conditions firsthand, Sir John Franklin, a man named commander of another expedition for the passage. And, despite the unforgiving conditions, in 1845, Sir John and his crew, 134 officers and men, aboard two exploration ships, would, like so many before them, set out in search of the Northwest Passage, one of the most dangerous expeditions in history. They were last seen entering Baffin Bay, July 26, 1845. The exact series of events that would follow are still unknown to this day.
Hello, and welcome back into the portal. I'm Amber A. And I'm Andrew McKay. And welcome back, everyone. No housekeeping this week on Into the Portal, aside from a quick mention that we have a brand new website that's beautiful that Amber has designed, so we really want you guys to go check it out and let us know what you think. This week, we are taking a different approach, a storytelling angle to the horrific tale of Sir John Franklin's final Arctic expedition. In this two-part series, we will first chronicle the history of John Franklin and the infamous quest for the Northwest Passage, while part two gets into the search, the evidence, and prominent theories about the fates of Franklin's men as they struggled for survival on the Arctic ice, hundreds of kilometers from the nearest thing to salvation. These men met a certain kind of darkness that we can only imagine in our worst nightmares, and it's become a story that has totally engulfed my life as of late, not just because of the research, but because of just how fascinating the speculation is and there's so much that we're going to get into and i'm just really excited because Mm -hmm. in the most remote and harsh regions of the canadian arctic an expedition of 134 officers and men would travel into basically completely uncharted waters there had been some men there before but basically uncharted waters living amongst the unforgiving elements of the ocean and the constant sub-zero temperatures of the arctic regularly reaching well below negative 40 degrees Celsius and and below that with wind chill. But despite these miserable conditions, the men pressed on in their search for the elusive Northwest Passage. It meant wealth of the world. It was the greatest prize a modern superpower could essentially attain controlling the high seas. But this was indeed one of the most dangerous expeditions in history, and exactly what took place is still unknown to this day. So this was the Franklin Expedition, and men had been trying to find this passage, the Northwest Passage, since King Henry VII, and all of them had failed in this effort. The only European to make it all the way to the Coppermine River in Nunavut, a prominent location, was a man named Samuel Hearn, who arrived there around 1771, and would give its latitude as 71 degrees, 55 north. He was a capitalist, a fur trader, and an explorer, But things would change later on, and explorers that came later, they did it for both glory and for country and crown. The two things keeping them motivated and eventually the thoughts keeping explorers alive, at least for a short period of time. There were many things that happened or may have happened on the Franklin Expedition that we will never know. But one thing's for sure, the lives of these 134 men were in the hands of a very competent captain or at least that's how he was viewed at the time. And his experience would have been at least some solace to the death and darkness of the North. So let's start with the man, Sir John Franklin. Sir John Franklin was a man of many exploits, a naval officer, explorer, colonial governor, and author. He was born the 16th of April in 1786 in Spilsby, England. The ninth child of Willingham Franklin and Hannah Weeks. As a young man, John became the head of the family in many ways. He maintained both warm family ties and a sense of responsibility for his many nieces and nephews, a characteristic that no doubt showed through with his efforts as a captain as well. And most would speculate that he certainly felt the same way about his crews as he did about his family. There's no doubt he was a caring leader and he definitely had a passion for the sea. John entered the Navy as a first-class volunteer October 1800 at the age of 14. April 2nd, 1801, he took part in the Battle of Copenhagen, commanded by the infamous Rear Admiral Sir Horatio Nelson. Franklin would even take part in the infamous Battle of Trafalgar, also led by Nelson, an epic sea exchange in which Nelson lost his life. Sniped down by a French sniper hiding in the rigging of one of the enemy ships, but he survived just long enough to know that they had won the battle. Franklin was only a teenager, but no doubt such an epic victory would propel his sea career. Franklin would spend time on various ships and participate in exploits, including battles on American soil around New Orleans. Over 2,000 British soldiers were killed by the American forces in this particular conflict. During the War of 1812, 
Franklin participated in many battles, including the Battle of Lake Bjorn. During an attack on American gunboats, Franklin was slightly wounded, but nevertheless, he was the first to board one of the American boats and accept the surrender of its captain. Then, in 1815, Franklin was assigned to the HMS 4th as first lieutenant at the special request of the commander, Captain Sir William Bolton. The 4th, according to records, really didn't do much. The only interesting or significant service the ship carried out was to transport the exiled Duchess de Angoulême, daughter of Marie Antoinette. Franklin then spent over two years ashore on half pay, but this was not the life that he wanted. Franklin was itching for real travel and exploration, and so when he heard about a planned naval expedition up the Congo River early in 1816, Franklin applied. However, unfortunately, this was denied. Then something special happened. The origins of this entire story would begin to take place. A year later, in 1817, there was word that the Admiralty was going to propose another Arctic exploration. This is when Franklin caught word, and he looked to everyone he knew to try and get his name on the list. Sure enough, his wish came true, and on the 14th of January, 1818, John Franklin was placed in charge of the HMS Trent on a new Arctic expedition this one being led by Commander David Buchan. There were two ships, the HMS Dorothy and the Trent, and they were directed to proceed north between Greenland and Spitsbergen, Svalbard, Norway, in the hope that they could reach the Bering Strait over the North Pole. The question we had reading Sir John's biography was, how crazy was this plan? At the exact same time, there was another expedition taking place on a trip to Baffin Bay in the quest of the Northwest Passage. This was by none other than Sir John Ross, a name that will come up again. He too, on this early expedition, would turn back like so many others before him, after extreme cold and the ice locked them up. As for Franklin... The basis for the crown to make expeditions was mostly based on reports from whaling ships that open water had been found north of Spitsbergen, allowing them to reach latitudes as high as 88 degrees or even 89 degrees north. However, despite these optimistic ideas, the expedition with Yukon did indeed run into heavy ice. Franklin actually offered to stay and continue with just one of the ships and a skeleton crew. But the ships had sustained significant damage, and even though they were equipped to make it through winter or more, they would return in October. For Buchan, he would never go on another Arctic expedition again. He made a smart choice, but not the brave one. That Buchan was never placed in charge of another expedition set a precedent for what was acceptable in these voyages. Success was imperative in the mind of the Empire. Franklin, on the other hand, had shown that he was not only eager, but selfless in the pursuit of the passage. His eagerness would result in more opportunity, and in early 1819, John Franklin was appointed to command a new expedition, this time not by ship, but by trekking overland across the Arctic coast. Franklin and his crew were to travel through Rupert's Land northwest of the Arctic coast by way of the Coppermine River. Their goal? Making it all the way through the Northwest Passage on foot, with as much as they could carry by sledge. A sledge is essentially a vehicle on runners for conveying loads or passengers over snow or ice, often pulled by draft animals, but also in some cases by men. It was a risky and ill-prepared expedition, that led to a new nickname for Franklin, the man who ate his boots. This was the first official mission into Canada's Arctic led by Sir John Franklin. The route was from the western shores of Hudson's Bay through difficult Arctic terrain through what is today Nunavut and the Northwest Territories, all the way to the aforementioned Coppermine River, 
and ultimately towards the shores of the Arctic Ocean. The group was only 20 men, and they were very poorly prepared for the harsh conditions of the Arctic. Franklin had planned to survive by hunting and obtaining food from the Inuit along their journey. What's particularly strange to compound their lack of preparation was that while the instructions given to Buchan, Ross, and Perry by the Admiralty outlined in very great detail the circumstances under which they were to abandon their missions, there was no such clauses included for Franklin's. No backup plan. Was this Franklin's idea or the Admiralty? His crew, however, did have some support from the men of two different companies, the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company. Outposts existed, of course. The one main problem for Franklin was these men were essentially trying to kill each other, literally taking other members as prisoners and stockpiling guns to wage war over the fur trade between these two groups. Not an ideal situation. Although some Northwest Company men did join Franklin's party. However, by August, it was too late for them to turn back. The hunting had nearly ceased and had to take to a different route, a trek to Fort Enterprise. This is where things start to get dark. Their sources of food, such as caribou, had started their southward migration much earlier than in the previous year, and living off the land had become essentially impossible. The later additions, such as the Northwest Company men, were definitely not used to the naval command structure Franklin employed, and being more knowledgeable about the country, they frequently clashed with Franklin's officers. The weakest members of the expedition were left behind once they had reached their furthest point while Franklin and others went on to find help. This was Franklin's first glimpse into the darkness of the North. The winter that year was unnaturally cold, so there were almost no animals available for hunting, for either indigenous or from Franklin's crew. Among the group left behind, what resulted was tensions leading to murder and cannibalism. Among Franklin's rescue party, some succumbed to starvation, eating lichens, bark, and even their own boots. The men would cut small strips of leather off of their shoes and slowly eat away the only thing they had protecting their feet. In total, only nine of the original 22 men survived. When they returned to England in October, Franklin quickly became both a national hero and well-known as the man who ate his own boots. With this epic story of survival, his status as a great explorer was nearly cemented, and he would end up leading expeditions to the mouth of the Mackenzie River and other ventures. His crews mapped thousands of miles of coastline, as well as documented important magnetic, geological, and zoological research. For all of this, he was knighted on the 29th of April, 1829, and other awards included an honorary degree from the University of Oxford and the gold medal of the Société de Géographie de Paris. But his potentially greatest expedition had yet to take place. This was not the end of Franklin's exploits. When we first talked about doing a podcast, I was honestly paralyzed by anxiety, mostly because of my fears of public speaking and expressing ideas in front of strangers. But we did it. (laughs) And I can only think that we probably could have accomplished much more with the project if we had started way back when we were in school. But I didn't have the help to get me to the confident place I am today with the show and everything else in life, especially speaking in front of large groups of complete strangers every day at work. Yeah, totally. And that's where BetterHelp.com comes in. Because BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, someone that can help you overcome your personal challenges and achieve your goals. And you can connect in a safe and private online environment. It's so easy and convenient. And this is professional counseling that you can count on. This is not a self-help website. This is something truly unique. You can access your specially matched counselor at any time without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. BetterHelp.com is private, secure, and makes it easy to get the help you need. You can begin communicating in under 24 hours with a specialized professional that can guide you with weekly scheduled video and phone sessions, and you can send a message anytime you need to with timely and helpful responses. Best of all, it's more affordable than traditional counseling options, and Into the Portal listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code PORTAL, spelled P-O-R-T-A-L. 
Yeah, so why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash portal or follow the link in this episode. That's P-O-R-T-A-L. Financial assistance is available for those who qualify. So please, if you feel like you could benefit from this, we encourage you to check it out. And again, that's discount code PORTAL, P-O-R-T-A-L, to get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. After several incidents, including an unsuccessful governorship in Tasmania, left Franklin's reputation in a somewhat murky status with the colonial office, which we will get into in part two, he was determined to once again capture the hearts of the people and the confidence of the Admiralty. Yet Franklin was not their first choice for command. In fact, most thought he was far too old for the job. At nearly 60 years old, an Arctic expedition in the mid-1800s was certainly a trying task. The command was first offered to James Ross, but he declined it. And so Franklin ended up getting the gig. There were two ships chosen, the Erebus and the Terror. Both warships turned into Arctic exploring vessels. Fitted with steel beams and reinforced decks, as two of the modifications put in place for these Arctic conditions. The ships were aptly named. The Terror is defined as the purveyor of extreme fear, and Erebus, the personification of darkness in Greek mythology, a place between man and the underworld on the way to Hades. Formidable names? Ominous for whom? The crewmen? or those they would encounter. Some considered this apt foreshadowing for the fates of the men. The two ships were originally constructed as bombing vessels that bombarded the enemy with rockets and cannon fodder. The HMS Terror was built in Topsham, Devon, and was listed variously as 326 or 340 tons. She was launched in 1813, specifically for service against the U.S. Most famously, it was the red glaring rockets from the Terror that the Americans were forced to fend off at Fort Henry that inspired the Star-Spangled Banner anthem. HMS Erebus was slightly larger and constructed in 1826 at Pembroke Dockyard. She was also a formidable warship, equipped with guns, cannons, everything necessary to wage war. But were they indeed the most advanced ships of their time? They were, of course, seasoned ships. Terror was once described as, quote, creaking with agony after heavy damage was sustained about 30 years earlier, while Erebus, the larger of the two ships, had navigated through Antarctica, made famous for doing so, adding to the lore of both ships. Both Erebus and Terror, on instructions from the Admiralty, as well as Franklin himself, brought up to a new level of technological standards, the best in class. It was thought that these ships, having been through wars and even Antarctic explorations, along with modern repairs and technology, were the best suited to break through the ice. This is a list of modifications made to Erebus and Terror. Former railway locomotive engines fitted as auxiliary power units with demountable funnels. Propellers were installed in wells so that they could be uncoupled and drawn up into the ship to reduce the risk of ice damage and water drag during travel. Massive strengthening of the ships, including diagonally crossed plank decks, a second layer of stout planking to double the thickness of the wooden hulls, watertight bulkheads and iron reinforced bows, warm air heating systems and modifications to the ship's galleys to provide not only a comfortable environment below decks, but also a supply of fresh water when the ships were frozen for the winter. Some of these innovations were actually very experimental and unique to just Erebus and Terror, never to be seen again, while others would become standard features on the Royal Navy's steam fleet for a generation to follow. More prepared than any other Arctic exploration before them, the Erebus and Terror set sail en route to find the Northwest Passage. On May 19th, 1845, Erebus and Terror set sail from the River Thames. Erebus was led by Sir John Franklin, captain and commander of the expedition as a whole, Commander James Fitzjames, 
Lieutenant Graham Gore, among others. The terror was led by Captain Francis Crozier, Lieutenant Edward Little, Lieutenant George Henry Hodson, and Lieutenant George Irving. As they left England, the crew was in good spirits, motivated by fame, wealth, and adventure. A 10,000-pound reward waited for them for finding the Northwest Passage, over 10 million today, on top, of course, of the regular pay for the trip. According to some sources, there was even a white dove that landed on the bow of Erebus as it left the docks. A sure sign for the men, they were destined for glory. They genuinely thought they would be able to reach the Pacific Ocean by the following summer and return home to Britain as heroes. A two, maybe three year journey tops. The Northwest Passage was seen at the time as a God given right, a necessity for the almighty British Navy, commander of the world's seas at the time, the height of its power, and they spared no expenses for this trip. Their certainty was in some ways instilled through their world understanding that centered on the exactness and order of nature. It stood to reason that if the Southwest Passage could be found, and was, at the tip of South America, surely the same must exist in the North. Symmetry was key to their understanding of the world. And as I said before, they spared no expense with these ships. Heavily laden, including the following. Over 3,000 books between the two ships for leisure reading and scientific reference. A hand organ on each ship for entertainment of the crew. Beautiful wood handcrafted chairs, desks, and writing implements. An early type of camera, very expensive at the time. And Franklin even had his own silverware carried aboard with the family crest. They also had thousands of dollars worth of magnetic equipment, as magnetism was huge at the time and the two ships had enough to establish a full research center in the Arctic. No expense was spared on food supplies either. Over 8,000 tins of preserved meat and vegetables, boiled, roasted, and seasoned mutton and veal, two tons of tobacco, 35 tons of flour for bread and biscuits, almost 8,000 liters of wine and rum, as well as the captain's private stocks of whiskey and gin, crates of chocolate and tea, and thousands of liters of lemon juice to help fend off scurvy. As the ships approached Greenland, Franklin sent one of his final letters back to his niece. It reads as follows. You will be glad to know the coming to the sea has had its usual good effect on me. I never, in fact, was in better health. I have every reason also to be happy, blessed as I am by having zealous and good young officers and an active, well-disposed crew. Franklin. This fact was corroborated by his second-in-command on Erebus, James Fitzjames, who documented nearly everything aboard. He stated that the men were well-treated by their officers. They even found and butchered ten oxen on Greenland and brought them aboard for fresh meat. Shortly after this, they rounded the tip of southern Greenland, They had already sent back five men due to early illness on the ships, as well as letters and journals from Fitzjames and other crewmen, speaking to the optimism of the expedition and confidence in Franklin as their leader. As they neared Baffin Bay, they had now only 129 men, one dog, and one monkey named Jacko. Entering Baffin Bay, Franklin and his crew were spotted by European whaling ships on July 26, 1845. This was the last time they were ever seen by Europeans. As they sailed into the wide mouth of Baffin Bay, into the ever-dropping temperatures of their first Arctic winter on Erebus and Terror, the ships proceeded to sail through the strait and through Lancaster Sound, just south of a place called Devon Island. They became the first Europeans to chart any further than this, and as they explored Wellington Channel and circled Cornwallis land, they completed the first official phase of their expedition. Nearing winter, the ships took shelter in a bay beside a place called Beachy Island, a place at the mouth of the Northwest Passage. The entire bay froze over, 
allowing the men to set up camps off ship and explore nearby. Here on Beachy Island, the Franklin expedition would lose its first three men. John Torrington, William Brain, and John Hartnell. Lost to pneumonia. But with modern excavations and investigations of the bodies, other interesting and much more insidious secrets were revealed. Things we will save for our theories and explanations in part two. After becoming freed from ice that first winter, the crew sailed south, only to encounter the teasing ice of Victoria Strait. Terror and Erebus had become trapped. After leaving the shelter near Beachy, they continued along through what is now known as Franklin Strait. But they ran into heavy pack ice, leftover remnants from the previous winter, making it extremely difficult for them to travel massive slabs passing by the ship. Traveling was now extremely slow, and the men would disembark to chip away ice surrounding the ships. Explosives were even used to break apart the ice in front of them. The men had what was thought to be ideal equipment at the time. Wool mittens, leather boots. But wool gets damp and can freeze in cold conditions, and leather likewise can freeze in sub-zero temperatures. Their outer coats made from felt, less than ideal for these Arctic conditions. In addition, after leaving England with optimism of their ship's power, both Erebus and Terror had steam props with only the capabilities of about 20 horsepower, while modern-day icebreakers have around 40,000. As they slowly moved towards King William Island, they became officially trapped in the ice, and the ice seemed to tease them in the most terrifying ways. Massive slabs would be driven up into the air on the pack to begin to melt in the summer, bringing hope and joy amongst the crew, only to freeze again, thicker than the year before. The plan was to wait, find game, and survive the cold until the pack opened up and allowed the ships to retreat. But they were running out of time. Imagine living on frozen ships, for years and years, the winter's so bitter cold, easily reaching well below minus 40 degrees Celsius and colder. And to top it off, darkness fell upon the ships for months at a time, a beautiful and terrifying environment all at once. What happened next isn't entirely clear. A plunge into darkness. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847. Neither the cause, nor the exact place or circumstances, are known. This concludes part one of our two-part series on the Lost Franklin Expedition. Look forward to part two, where we focus on the historic search for Franklin, including emerging evidence that insidious forces were at work amongst the men. Forces that the Crown viciously denied. As always, we'd like to thank our regular sponsors of the show, Audible.com, BetterHelp.com, and all of our Patreon supporters, as well as our producer, Tim Godby. We will leave you with this. As the crew faced extreme uncertainties in the harsh winter landscape of the Arctic, Surrounded by expansive snow-blown tundra, rock, and dramatic formations of ice, lit up only by the dazzling beauty of the northern lights, illuminating their ships during the darkest months. Certainly, the dire nature of their circumstances would not have been lost on the men. One can only wonder what subjects occupied their thoughts, as they remained trapped amongst frozen giants of ice riddling a land of stark emptiness, a place so barren that even the Inuit had given up on it. But these were hardened sailors, marines and officers, captained by experienced and able men. So when the ships became prisoners of ice, the question is, were they scared or hopeful? For how long were they confident in their supplies and their leadership? As the weeks turned into months, the months into years, 
they waited for the frozen pack to thaw, hoping the ships would be freed, allowing them to either continue or retreat. But what exactly took place as they waited remains a mystery to this day, as those who followed would slowly piece together a bizarre story, one filled with a darkness the likes of which most can barely imagine in their worst nightmares. This was the story of the Franklin Expedition. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.